So, uh, <laughs> first of all, the wisdom of the community, that's the title. And uh, before I go any further, I need to do a little bit of expectation management. Uh, there's not going to be any fucking in the audience. <laughs> just, just that that's clear. I do sense that this can be slightly misleading or even confusing, but I will explain what's happening here in a moment. But before that happens, I need to quote my mom. Live performance is ephemeral. The only thing you have to show for your work is fading reviews and wounds that never heal. <laughs> my mom. For uh, context, my mother is a uh, theater and circus director. She made this comment in a, in a speech she gave at the 25th anniversary celebrations of, the, of her theater. So it's based on uh, experience. So, <laughs> LARP is ephemeral. The only thing you have to show for your work is uh, KP books and wounds that never heal. And that is also the topic of this uh, talk, is the KP books. And the whole uh, tradition of them that we, that we have. Uh, the whole uh, KP book phenomenon started in uh, Norway in 2001. And just for, uh, we had a little bit of confusion about this already earlier, so I just want to clarify that this is the cover of the book. I, s I, s I scanned it from a physical copy with my own hands. It's, 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 this is what it looks like. This is what it looked like in 2001. And what a KP book is, it's a collection of uh, design articles, articles about experiences, all kinds of stuff uh, relating to LARP. But the real, so this is where it started, but this is where it kind of actually started, I would say. So 2003, here in Denmark. This is the book uh, where I had my first article that uh, reached like any sort of an audience and uh, I, was, I was 22 and uh, less, less, less bearded. So uh, so it was a great uh, thing to have. It was a great thing to have, a kind of a forum where uh, I could share some of the ideas, some of the kind of thinking, some of the kind of, I in the title it said, the wisdom of the community, so my wisdom uh, under this title. <laughs> so uh, so that's why, what, why, why I started with that. Because uh, for me personally, the first KP book as, as LARP grows up means a lot because it's where I also uh, started. And this is to me one of the most important things that the KP books do is that they provide a platform, a platform for, uh, sure platform for me, but also a platform for uh, new people, platform for young people, platform for people who are not young but are new to the KP community to people who have ideas, who have experiences, and who want to have those experiences uh, somehow made less ephemeral, because LARP disappears, but uh, th the books are very physical, thankfully. Over the years, we've had a lot of these. 29 books over 22 years. I think that's pretty good. I think that is pretty good. <laughs> I'm just going to count the wins for a little bit. I already mentioned that the books as a platform for uh, new and old, and uh, new writers who are new to writing but are also old. Uh, that goes a little bit deeper than just giving like a, a thing where these articles are published. It also has to do with the editorial attitude different editorial themes have had over the years. I've made two of these, so I can speak for myself. But I think I can also speak for, I think, everybody who has been making these things. When I say that the goal is to have those new people in there and the goal is to help them. 
and uh, that's work, but that's very meaningful work for the community. And uh, often you have really amazing thinking from uh, people who are new, and with a little bit of work, it ends up in the book, it looks great, it influences people's thinking when they read it, and so on, so it's, uh, it's amazing. The way this works is that uh, the system is decentralized. So there's no central KP book authority any more than there is central KP authority. And that means that every book is sort of uh, a little different, which is great. It's made with, with different teams, with different kind of sensibilities, different kind of ideals, different kind of principles, which give the books a sense of uh, freshness. Uh, another win I'm going to point out to is book number three, Beyond Role and Play. Uh, it's the book that introduced a format that is very specific to the KP books, which is the quasi-academic format. They could also call it the fake academic format. <laughs> but uh, it, it means, we can laugh at it, but in my opinion, it is amazing. It's an amazing thing. Uh, what it does is that, like maybe some of us were just at the university as students or something when this started. I don't know. But, uh, but uh, or actually I do know, in Beyond Role and Play, uh, it, it was at the beginning of, or at the early stages of another phenomenon, uh, academic life studies. And uh, it has it that grew into a huge, beautiful thing of its own. But uh, at this point, the KP books and academic life studies were more uh, connected. And that's why it's a sort of format lived on. But it, give it give gave us the idea that you have to explain your concepts very clearly. You have to have this sort of a neutral voice. And, uh, and the article itself has to be understandable like by itself. Conveniently, this means that when I write something in this style, some uh, person in Brazil who has never met me and who has never been to a KP can still sort of understand what I'm talking about. And you'll understand the value this has when you try to make sense of the writings in some <laughs> other communities that don't do this. I have, for example, myself read a lot of uh, early role-playing game, tabletop role-playing game, game theory from uh, the uh, early 2000s. Some people may know the Forge community. Some people may know uh, the expression that you must look up the threads. That means that you're, you're expected to go on some forum that was defunct in like 10 years ago and look up a thread. Like what the fuck? In a KP book, the only thing you have to look up from uh, 2003 or four or five is a PDF and you just read it. That's great. <laughs> Yay to us. That's accessibility. <laughs> I'm serious. The fake academic thing is, is, a, is, is wonderful. It has been wonderful for us. Okay, but I also made a few of these myself, so I'm going to just also count my own wins. States of Play edited that. It had three variant covers. Also a secret fourth cover. Maybe not as important as the some other things here, but I'm just going to say it. Also, the last one, I also edited Distance of Touch, a fold-out. <laughs> also, I would say a major win <laughs> in, the field of, uh, in the field of these things. Okay, but then when you just look around here, you notice that 29 books is actually more than 22 years. So there's more books like per year. In Denmark, they decided, no, we're not going to do one book, we're going to do three books. So do, talk, think. Then in Norway, they make it made this even more ambitious thing, crossing physical, habitual, theoretical, and even exploring borders. Lots of borders there. But, uh, but just amazing stuff. Then there is uh, the book uh, Foundation Stone of Nordic LARP, which has an amazing uh, story. It's a story of uh, KP book editor Eleanor Saita, who entered our community in the following way. She heard from a friend of, of us and the books. And then she read all the books. She read all the books. And then she joined us and edited some more books. <laughs> Foundation Stone of Nordic Lore, but she's also responsible for what do we do when we play. To me, that is, that is amazing. I am in awe of this journey. Uh, among the wins, of course, is the book uh, LARP Design from Denmark, the last Danish book, which is, I think, the best sort of collection of 
LARP Design Wisdom, there is just an, uh, an amazing tome, also a great um, home defense weapon if you need it <laughs> for, that, uh, for that purpose. And uh, already I think our community is old enough that, uh, that we have a bit of history. History is right here. And we notice that the things that are not written down they disappear because LARP is ephemeral. They disappear. And in a hundred years, the situation is going to be this. You can have a LARP that has had a 10,000 players somewhere, and nobody will remember that shit. And then you can have a LARP that had 10 players, and it's in one of these things. And people will know, know about it. And I know, because I made a LARP called Luminescence that had 20 players, and people still talk about it somewhere because I've wrote about it. There are bigger, uh, you can do that too, as long as there's a platform for it. But the historical thing is a real, is, it's a real thing. This is, this is what remains. These are the actual things that, uh, that exist. So, uh, to sum all of that up, we are the best. <laughs> that's, that's, that's what I'm saying. This is the most comprehensive, extensive, magnificent collection of LARP writing in the entire world. Since we are in Denmark, I'm just going to sort of, I, I decided to do a special slide about all the Danish wins when it comes to uh, KP books. Of course, I, I think at the time, I don't know if the people who made us LARP grows up knew what they were starting. They knew the tradition they were uh, at the starting point of, but it's, uh, it's a magnificent thing right now. And even they had a sense of uh, kind of a historical mission, because uh, some of these LARP manifestos that were important at that time were republished in, in that book. So this idea that you need to preserve these things so that people, for example, right now can read them, it was already present in 2003 at that point. Then, of course, there were the three three book year, very hard to follow up. There's uh, LARP Design. Lifelike was the second uh, Danish KP book, the first one in hard covers. And I remember when I just got that in my hand and I thought, God damn it, they are upping the game. <laughs> we have to do this now. So yeah. Uh, To recap, 29 books, 22 years. Uh, one thing that you notice when you look at all these things is the question of who makes these things, who are the editors? And when I started counting, 83%, 83% of KP books have been edited by new editors, new people. So it's not a small clique of individuals who have been making these things, but it's always been or almost always have been new people. Uh, new new uh, ideas, new kind of uh, approaches. And that's also, that also means that, that you can do it too. A lot of people before you <laughs> have already done it. I want you to keep that in mind as I go to the next topic of, uh, of this whole thing, which is of course the undertaker. I realize this is a slight sound sidetrack, but you understand what, where this is coming from in a moment. The Undertaker is an American wrestler uh, <laughs> who is, who is uh, quite famous for uh, the streak. What is the streak? WrestleMania is, uh, is a huge wrestling event held at the different cities in the U.S. Uh, every year. Uh, huge spectacle in the world of uh, show wrestling. And uh, The Undertaker is known for winning a match at WrestleMania 20 th 20, 21 times consecutively. So the streak is 21 years he wins every time. That is the streak. The streak starts in, in 91 when uh, The Undertaker beats uh, Jimmy Snuka. The streak ends in 2014 
as uh, Brock Lesnar defeats The Undertaker. This trick, 20 consecutive years of KP books, starting with uh, Arf Slarp Grows Up, and ending this year because Denmark doesn't publish a KP book. The Undertaker wins! 21 to 20. Uh, I'm gonna distill some personal feelings about this whole thing <laughs> into one word. But before I get to that one word, since the situation is that uh, KP starts tomorrow, uh, and I don't want to be a negative Nelly. So, what I would love us now to do is to remember that the KP is an amazing event. It takes a huge amount of work to do. All of that is amazing work. I'm personally very, very much looking forward to it. And I think this year's organizers have done an amazing job. So, before we go any further uh, and into that one word, I would just like us to give a big hand to this year's organizers who are wonderful. Thank you. And now we get to the one word. Shame! <laughs> but there's a, there's a little bit of hope to beat the Undertaker. Because uh, as you may, s may, may, may have gathered, one thing is heavily to our advantage, and it is the fact, this is a little bit brutal, but I hope you accept it, The Undertaker is very old, and he's, uh, he's a professional wrestler, and that is uh, uh, something that when you do that for a long time, it, it wrecks up your body, so it's very unlikely that he is going to beat his own streak. I think he's, he, he topped at 21. That's, that's going to be where he stays, I think. Uh, us, on the other hand, are a self-replenishing community. <laughs> that is uh, the difference between us and the undertaker. <laughs> <laughs> so, what I would... Uh, love to see is maybe we could take another stab at the streak whether we can see if we can beat the undertaker we took a one stab it failed but now streak number two our second try begins next year in Finland 2024 it ends never I uh, thank you for the applause, and I think the call to action was clear. However, just to make this like super clear, I think let me talk to you to, to you about another another wrestler, <laughs> Daniel Bryant. Daniel Bryant is known for a very simple tagline. It is this: you will have to memorize it on the first go. The tagline is. Yes! <laughs> or two-hand version. Yes! <laughs> the finger. But properly, you don't have mics, you can, you can do it two hands. So what I would just like to ask you now is whether do you think this community and all of us can beat THE UNDERTAKER! 
Can we beat the undertaker? Yes. Can we beat the undertaker? Yes. Thank you.